uh, don't like me very much. I have a real difficult time with women that don't like me. That's not true. I have a real difficult time with women who uh, leave their families. That's because that's what both of my ex-wives did. They abandoned us. Couldn't make any sense out of it. So it was tough. It was tough for a number of years. So the problem was that if I had a woman that came in who had left her, her family, uh, and I had to counsel her, who was I really counseling when I talked to her? Yourself. I, was, I, was to me, I was talking to myself more than anybody else. And I had a really tough time with it. That's not very really good. Okay, so this is just something that you need to think about. If you've got a problem with something, you need to deal with it. You need to think about it. Instead of repressing this idea, then you need to deal with it. <clears throat> so if you, if you have a lot of, of uh, mental issues, a lot of emotional issues, you need to figure this out before you get into counseling. That's a hint of warning. First counseling class, and, and I've already told you that you need to deal with your own problems. Uh, but it's true. You need, to, you need to understand yourself. And this is the first thing that they will teach you, if you get, when you get into a master's program. Uh, most counselors are, under, are uh, under another counselor. In other words, they're counseling themselves. <clears throat> they, have to counsel, they have to counsel themselves. Sometimes you'll come across a problem that uh, just sticks with you and you can't get rid of it. Uh, and of course you need to get rid of it because you need to move on. Otherwise, the next person that comes in, you're dealing with the same problem that, that you had before. And you're, you're not getting rid of it. You're not really dealing with the, new, with the new client. You're dealing with the old client and the old client's problems. And you're reading everything through that client's problems. Just like you're reading everything through your ex-wife's problems or your ex-husband's problems. Or <clears throat> Usually, you refer to them as the jackass. <laughs> I know. I didn't make that up. Uh, you need to understand the client's personal beliefs. You need to understand who they are. Uh, it's, and it's not a bad idea. We're going to talk about this. Uh, you need to understand who they are. Uh, how many different tribes are there in, in Arizona? Two? No. Three? Two. 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 So what if you had a person that came in that was kind of old? Yeah. 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 What if you had somebody who was different? Or somebody that was Pima, or somebody that was Coma. I had a friend that was, uh, when I first, uh, native guy that I, that I uh, served with when I was in the military was a guy from the Laguna <laughs> Club. As interesting as that. Laguna, he was a Laguna. And his wife was Kiowa. So there's 26 tribes? Okay, so you may come in contact with, even in Arizona or New Mexico, you may come in contact with 26 different people that are native. Uh, do you understand that they're different? Or are they all... <laughs> Stephanie and I were talking about this yesterday. <laughs> we were talking about this yesterday. White people think that everybody wants to be white. They, so they try to teach people to be white. That's why they sent everybody to boarding schools. That's what they were doing. Uh, they want black people to act white. They want Hispanics to, to, to be white. They don't want them to speak their own language. They want them to speak English. And that's one of the reasons why there's all this immigration problem. That we're having right now. Uh, because there are a lot of white people out there that want everybody to be white. Right? If you're an American, isn't that what an American is? An American, a white person? And the answer is no. No, of course not. So as a native, you can't want all natives to act like you, to be like you. They have to have different ideas. They will have different ideas. They came from a different culture. And you have to accept that culture. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you're counseling uh, Tano Odom or somebody from the San Carlos Reservation or Mojave from, from way down south, uh, you, can't, you can't try to make them Navajo. It just isn't the way it should be. You should let them be who they are. 
well, you don't have a choice. They will be doing that. And if you try to counsel them, telling them, oh, look, you need to be this way, then it ain't going to work. They're going to be doing that. Hopefully, you don't want to change people like that. You want them to change in a positive manner that has to do with their own, with their own culture. Does all that make sense? So what if you're counseling a white person? You know, send them to a ceremony? If you want. Get them a name. Probably won't work. I'm guessing it will work. Okay, so uh, what are we, are we talking about? You, so you need to accept their personal beliefs. Uh, you need to recognize that they, that they have their own culture. And you need to figure out what that is. Um, right now in the in the United States, we got a, we have a problem with cell phones. I forgot mine today, or I pull it out and act like I was doing something. I can't even read my text messages. <laughs> I just went, oh, so people text me and I have no idea. I broke down in, in Gallup. I couldn't open my uh, my gas tank. Uh, the the cover wouldn't open up. I know it locks itself. Uh, and I couldn't get it to, to unlock. So I called uh, Mazda Assistance. It's a, it's a Mazda in the eye. And uh, they said, well, uh, we will uh, we'll text you how to, how to fix your car. <laughs> I'm going, I know. <laughs> and I did this like three times, and they kept telling me they were going to text me. I was hoping that they would call me on the telephone. Uh, eventually, I figured out a way to get them to call me. Okay. And, and then they called me and told me that there's no way to fix what I, my problem. I know. But eventually it just came open. So, oh anyway, so clients have their cultures. How closely do they adhere to the culture in which they grew up? This is a real, this is a real interesting question here on the reservation. How Navajo are you? Just because you live on the reservation, just because you grew up in, in a, a Navajo home, does that mean that you are a traditional Navajo? And the answer is probably no. If we if we uh, put you all on a spectrum of, uh, of traditionalism, uh, you'd be all over the place. You'd all be all over the place, probably. I'm guessing. Does that make sense? So you never know, and you've got to figure it out. Because if somebody, if, if you send somebody to a ceremony and they don't really believe in that kind of stuff, or you've just wasted, I don't know how much money does it cost for you to do well, all the to the ceremony and, and how long it takes. But they just wasted all that money. And that doesn't make any sense at all. So you need to deal with the, the, the client as the client, who the client is. And you need to figure this out. And this is a little bit tougher with, with natives than it is with white people. Hispanics or African Americans. A little bit different. Uh, the client's race. How strongly do they identify with their racial structure? Uh, being in Salem, this is Diné College, therefore it's a lot. It's, uh, we figure that uh, the individuals here are, are Diné, so we don't have to worry about it. However, when you're out counseling, you never know. You just never know. Be, just because they're native doesn't mean they identify with their, with, uh, with their nativeness. Uh, up on uh, Fort Belknap, we had a problem uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, they would foster kids off the reservation. And what they were doing, they were fostering. They, they did the same thing here. They sent the Mormon, they sent them up to Mormon territory, didn't they? And they'd kind of adopt them, they'd foster them, and they'd use them for child labor. That what was happening. Yeah. The same thing was happening up north. Uh, it was a program that was going on all over the United States. It didn't just have to do with native children. It also had to do with anybody, anywhere. Uh, so they were taking kids out of the city, the black kids out of the city, and they were sending them to farmers uh, in the rural areas of Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois. I'm out of chairs, so we're, we're going to have to find one. Stephanie took the last chair. And I've got one. Yeah, so you can just go back into your blackboard. I got a snowball stance then. <laughs> what do you want to say? 
Any words less than 100 C? Oh, well, how about right here? <laughs> <laughs> Just move in on everybody else's territory. Sure. Thank Why you. Not? So race is really important, uh, but we, we just because somebody looks one way doesn't mean that they're going to act that way. You can't tell how somebody's going to act just because of the way that they look. Maybe they look Asian. Have you seen the new movie? Evidently rich. Are you rich Asian? Rich Asian. I've heard rich. of that. I know. <laughs> Evidently, it's a really good movie, but the but people from uh, who of Asian descent are pissed. Of course, they're not the ones that made the movie. It's I don't know. I know. But they're going, oh, this is stereotypical. This is horrible. <laughs> so the question is, what do they think? What do they think? And it really doesn't matter what you think about African Americans, what you think about Hispanics, what you think about other tribes. It all depends on what they think. Yes, ma'am? Would you like a story to go with that? Sure. I'm, I was dying for a story. <laughs> well, you like stories. I was in an IEP meeting last semester. Okay. And the district psychologist, whose name I do not remember, thank you, and um, <laughs> we were talk going over a study that she had done of my child. And she leans into my personal space, like sure. from where he is to here, and said, you're an Anglo, you know how those people are. And I said, excuse me? And she just kept on going is what she said. And so again I said, excuse me? She never was never to give me a chance to put my my two cents in. Sure. And so as my blood is boiling. Was she native? I don't know. Okay. I'm because what I told her was, excuse me, time out. This meeting is on hold. I have something to say. And by then, I mean, steam was coming out of my ears. Sure. My eyes were blood red. And I said, excuse me. I happen to be a very proud and happy Cherokee Hopohatan mix. My mother was Anglo, not me. She was German and Czech. I inherited some of her skin. But I am not white. And I take great offense to that. You look, don't look like a Navajo. You look like you're Mexican. And if I get into your space and your face and say, well, you know how those Mexicans are. <laughs> and she just looked at me. Now, mind you, the district supervisor was there. The district psych um, social worker was there. And I was, oh, I went off. I just, she hit me the right way, the wrong time. <laughs> Excellent point. This is an excellent point. So but I also oh sorry. Go ahead. A second. I also told her. I said, "How can you say anything about race or who where an ancestry of a person?" Right. You learned in intro to counseling in psychology. Not if she didn't take it from me. <laughs> well, I know we know in one hundred and one that you never ever ever bring us anything about race right. or ancestry right. in any situation as a professional. Right. Otherwise you're stereotyped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this is this is an, an interesting point. It really doesn't matter what somebody looks like. It really doesn't matter what their race is or what their ethnicity is. Yes. If they're raised in a select culture, then they're from that culture. Isn't that the way it works? Mm -hmm. We react, the way we react is the culture that we were raised in. So if I were raised uh, in the black culture of Chicago, I would be speaking with a different patois. Yeah. But I was raised on a farm in Indiana, so I speak like a farmer from Indiana. So does that make me Diné culture? Because I've been If you were raised in the Diné culture... No, I was raised in between Cherokee and Anglo, but I've been out here for 30 years. Does that equal assimilation? It, uh, no, well, it, uh, it equals uh, well, however you identify yourself. That's, that's the culture that you belong to. Mm -hmm. um, well, will you ever be accepted by the culture fully? And the answer is probably no. Because no. it's just the way it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a white person and you're... And you've seen those movies, the movies where the white guy acts 
blacker than the, than the other people, than the African Americans in the movie. Uh, you've seen those movies. And the reality is, if you grow up in a culture, that's the culture that you have. Or the culture that you accept. Does that make sense? Sure, why not? <laughs> I know, so we can't tell, we can't tell what, you know, how somebody like can... the way like, some natives are raised on the reservation and live on that reservation right. cultural lifestyle and other natives live more of an urban lifestyle right. in the cities and even there it's specific to, to the regions in which they're right. located in the cities and suburbs. Right. So. right, and it all depends on, on what, the where culture. the urban area is. Yeah. Exactly. Like there's a 4th Street culture, there's a 6th Street culture, there's a 12th Street culture. That's talking about two songs. <laughs> there's an MS-13 culture over there. There is. I don't know I haven't figured that one out yet. <clears throat> uh, if somebody is of mixed race, uh, you, do you, it, just because they look one way doesn't mean that that's, what, that's who they identify with. Maybe they identify with the other race. And this can be a, a problem. If you look one way and, and you... Uh, identify with, with another group. A uh, perfect example is Eric Erickson. He was Jewish, but he was blonde-headed and blue-eyed. Uh, Jewish people tend to be dark-haired, curly-haired, uh, relatively dark complexion, but here's this very, very pale guy. He looks German. Uh, but the Germans hated him because he was Jewish, and Jewish people hated him because he looked German. And because of that, he had a very difficult time. So uh, this, is, this can be a problem with people. Uh, with both feet in, in two different cultures. And of course, uh, we will be dealing with that uh, later, dealing with uh, uh, people with, both, with a foot in each culture. Uh, if there's more than one, uh, the multiracial aspect is, will become a factor, and of course, that's what I was just talking about. Uh, a counselor needs to recognize that their own, uh, their own culture might influence the way that they see and interpret other clients, their clients. Uh, you need to understand that uh, that you are prejudice, mm -hmm. and there's no way you can get rid of it. And it may, and, and you may fight it, uh, but uh, of course you think that your own culture is correct, is always correct. Uh, this has been a problem. Obviously, it's a problem. We can see it through history. Europeans came over here and they tried to make you guys look like, or look and act like like Europeans. They tried to put clothes on everybody. Lots of clothes on everybody. I don't know if you know how these people are dressed, but they didn't even show their necks. They wore gloves. They didn't show their, their wrists. As stupid as they are, I know. They, an ankle, that's hot stuff. So, <laughs> I know. So they tried to cover everything. If you, uh, Especially if you look at the history of Hawaii. Hawaiians didn't wear any clothes. If you've ever been to Hawaii, it's hot there. It's nice and warm. You don't need any clothes, do you? And it's human, so <laughs> you don't need any clothes. So they didn't wear any clothes, and they thought it was perfectly fine. Well, the missionaries came over, of course, American missionaries, and put clothes on these people. And now, if you go to a uh, luau, especially if it's a Mormon luau, they've got all the clothes on in the world. Well, they never wore clothes. They wore grass skirts, and if they put anything on top, they put something on top. Usually they didn't wear anything. And that's just the way it was. That was their culture. But of course the missionaries came and put clothes on everybody. <laughs> as, as, as horrible as that is, they told them how to dress. But they did but the Europeans did the same thing in boarding schools. How did they dress up uh, American Indians in boarding schools? Everybody had a uniform. They're turning you into little soldiers. Mm -hmm. What were they teaching you? They were teaching you agricultural, agriculture and home economics. As exciting as that is. Okay, anyway. <laughs> uh, a counselor needs to recognize that their racial background might influence the way, way that they see others, especially if those others are from another race. Uh, let me tell you a horrible, horrible story. Once upon a time in a land far, far away, Mississippi, South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, uh, all of the social workers were uh, white. What a shock that that is. Most of their clients were black. Uh, they had a really, really hard time dealing with their black clients, mainly because they didn't care about their black clients. Mm -hmm. They had stereotypes about African Americans, <coughs> and they assumed that these people were going to react the way that, that uh, they, they expected them to react. 
uh, mainly because most of these individuals weren't allowed to be educated until later on. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't until the 20th century uh, that education was universal in the South, and it still wasn't universal in the South, even in the 20th century. It took World War I before they started educating everybody. It was against the law to educate a black person before, before the Civil War. So there were a lot of individuals who couldn't read and write. Well, there were, there were everybody, nobody could read and write. And uh, uh, teachers from the North would come down, especially white female teachers from the North, uh, and, and they're the ones that started educating African Americans in the South. And the, and the uh, white people in the South were really upset about it. To the extent that, that uh, they put together organizations, uh, Ku Klux Klan was one of those organizations, and they would run them out of town. They would tar and feather them. They would kill them. If they were male, they would kill them. If they were female, they would tar and feather them. Uh, as horrible as that sounds. So this, uh, this idea carried through into the 20th, into the 20th century. And this is part of what civil rights was all about in the 1960s. Uh, these individuals were not being treated well. The social workers were not, not dealing with them very well. <clears throat> My wife is from Georgia. Her mother worked in, in the government in Georgia. And uh, some of the stories that she would tell uh, her family were, was just appalling. Uh, she complained about their name. She complained about the fact that they didn't understand how, how, where babies came from. I mean, it was just horrible. And of course, this is in the 1960s. And now, of course, uh, you wouldn't see the same thing. But, that, but uh, for, for the longest period of time, we had individuals that didn't uh, like or work with the uh, population that they were supposed to be helping. And uh, the same thing may have happened uh, on, on the Indian reservations as well. Um, yeah. There's nobody that, that hates Indians more than somebody from a white guy from Montana, as odd as that seems. So if you're a white guy who's not from Montana and you go to Montana and uh, work on the Indian reservation, you're kind of a, a shunned individual. You're not native, but the white population won't have anything to do with you. It's really kind of, uh, kind of a sad situation. So there's a lot of prejudice out there. That's, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. Okay. <laughs> I don't want you guys to be prejudiced. I want you to accept everybody, which is not the easiest thing in the world. Counseling needs to come to groups with their own ethnicity and how that uh, influences who they are and how they see others. One of the problems with social work has been in the past that the people that are going into social work, social work doesn't pay very well. So who goes into social work? Rich white women. And sadly enough, and do, do they understand? Uh, let me give you an example that uh, we, we heard like it was three weeks ago. The president was giving a speech and he said, uh, well, you need not identification to, uh, what was it, to get a driver's license and you need an identification to buy groceries. You need a picture ID to buy groceries. <laughs> Remember that when he said that? Do you need an ID to buy groceries? <clears throat> Why would he say that? Because he's never bought groceries before. Yeah. <laughs> and this is this is what we're this is the kind of situation we were dealing with. We had all these rich white ladies, and they had no idea what it was like to be poor. They they had seen it, but they had never experienced it themselves. Um, Oprah Winfrey had submitted a video online, and somebody asked her when was the last time she went grocery shopping, and she was just. <laughs> the richest lady on television, as exciting as that is. Of course, she grew up very poor in the South. And that she actually had a child when she was 14 that she had to give up, which is kind of a tragedy in itself. I used to live right next to where Oprah Winfrey was born, well, down the, down the road from where Oprah Winfrey was born. I, I, taught, I uh, taught in Mississippi. My wife was stationed there. Uh, Self-understanding is an essential step in understanding your clients. And of course, you need to know who you are in order to understand who your clients are. There are multiple influences on how you see yourself and interpret the world around you. Well, there are lots of different reasons that you see things one way and, and other people see things another way. 
I have a brother that's very conservative. I'm not. We, we grew up in the same place at the same time. We were contemporaries. Uh, he was five years younger than I am, but he's extremely conservative. I mean, con more conservative than you can imagine. Not only did he vote for Donald Trump, I mean, he, he carries a gun around. He carries a pistol around because it's so dangerous. His world is so dangerous. Why is his world more dangerous than my world? It's his interpretation of the world. He, see, well, he also lives in South Carolina. So. Uh, South Carolina is the most dangerous state in the Union, I'll have to admit. But I don't know that he really needs that gun. He's never pulled it. So why does he need it? Uh, OK, so it all depends on the way you interpret the world. And that's my brother. Your culture, your race, your ethnicity are all important to you. Should be. You should. Accept who you are. Uh, this was tough. I thought we had uh, Indian ancestry. I actually thought we had Afri African ancestry. But I did that DNA thing, and it turns out we're like the whitest people <laughs> in the world. She was shocked. She's right down. <laughs> the whitest guy in the United States. What does your ancestry say? Uh, we're, I'm from Western Europe. I'm German, French, and English, like 50% English. Okay, my sister did the DNA thing. Uh -huh. And she called me in such a panic. She says, But we're white according to DNA. I said, Excuse me? We're white. And I said, Yeah, yeah, we're white skin. We're from white color tribes. Yeah. And she says, But that means we're not who we are. We've been lied to. I said, Time out. Your genealogy does not lie. The people doing the DNA can make a mistake. And DNA from a hundred years ago does not necessarily come into your modern DNA. Well, actually does it does. It? Yes, of course it does. Does it? Of course it does. <laughs> of course it does. But I told her, I said, go with your genealogy. Don't worry about it. Go with your culture. Wherever, however you were raised, that's what you should go with. Uh, we've got an argument going on right now with uh, the uh, senator from Massachusetts. Says she has native ancestry. Trump makes fun of her, calls her Pocahontas. Oh yeah. That's, uh, that's but her her family comes from Oklahoma, uh, so there's a great possibility that she does have native ancestry. Uh, but she's blonde headed and very pale, and and he likes to make fun of her. Uh, but the reality, I mean, it, it all depends on 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 the way you're raised. And if you're told, if you're told that your family has native ancestry and you've already always grown up that way, then there's no problem with you accepting that as part of your culture. Well, see, her files are locked because of ICWA. Indian Child Welfare Act. Oh. She cannot get her original birth certificate because she was adopted by a Jewish family. So you're talking about your sister? I'm talking about my sister. Okay. And, um, well, you can have DNA I, studies and it'll tell you exactly what your ancestry is. Well, no, yes. I want to go to, to uh, National Geographic. They're supposed to be able to go back to uh, as far as Lucy and the prehistorics. I think that would be fun and interesting. As it's going to turn out, we're all oh. mixed. <laughs> <laughs> None of us are pure <laughs> anything. <laughs> the, 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 the most unpure people in the, United, in the world are the Brits because everybody and their cousin conquered England and left them some DNA, if you know what I mean. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> there were Celts, the, the Celts were there, and then the Germans came in, and then the Vikings came in, and then the Romans came in, and everybody's leaving a little bit of DNA as they go. Sorry. <clears throat> anyway, so the Brits are probably the most bastardized population <laughs> in the world. And the other most bastardized population are the Germans. Germany didn't, uh, wasn't established as a country until 1870. And so there was, the Poles came in, then the Swedes came down, and the Romans went up. And, they don't and like to admit the Irish, but the Irish went there too. The, everybody was there. <laughs> everybody and their cousin, and of course they're all leaving little drops of DNA all over the place. Anyway, so the Germans are about the, the least pure people in the world. It was really kind of interesting what Hitler did, and there was a reason why Hitler did what he did. 
it's because the, the Germans are a very bastardized people. They've got Slavs coming in and Tatars coming in and all, all, everybody and their cousin has made babies in Germany. So he tried to create this concept of a pure race, of an Aryan race. And they're about as Aryan as, I don't know, as nobody. <laughs> anyway, so the reality is that there's no such thing as purity, I guess. What are we talking about? Okay, uh, so your, ra your culture, your race, and ethnicity are important. Your gender and sexual orientation are, are influential. And we're going to talk about that, but it's not exactly the same thing. Your socioeconomic status, your spirituality and religion, your, your life stage, your family of origin, your, dis and, or your disability or ability are uh, influential as far as you, you are concerned. All of the stuff makes up who you are. And you can't get away from any of it. I'm a male. My sexual orientation is heterosexual. There's nothing I can do about it. I can't be a Latina or Latina. I want to be a Latina when I grow up. The level of stress demands in your life uh, is, is important as well. And of course, I've already told you about some of my stresses. Two divorces and 12 years in the military. What else happened to me? My God. I worked in the morgue for 30 years. You know, that's, that's got to do something to you. depressing. What? Working in the morgue? Nah, we used to joke about it. <laughs> it's kind of ghoulish, I guess. Sorry about that. Multicultural competence is a significant predictor of satisfaction in counseling. So you need to understand everybody's different. If you only wanted to counsel Navajos, it ain't going to make any difference. Maybe you will only counsel Navajos. But they're all going to be different. You're going to have teenagers that think that they're black. Or they think they're, they're, what is that Grand Theft Auto, Los Angeles? All you have to do is play that a couple times and all of a sudden you think you're in you know, in Los Angeles or something. I don't know how it works. Maybe you play those games where you shoot zombies. Who shoots zombies? What's a zombie? What is that? <laughs> Difficulties may arise uh, from unknowledge unacknowledged differences in perception and of course this is the problem uh, usually it's a misperception that somebody has that's why they're, they're having problems so you need to correct their misperceptions and all has to do with interpretation it is critical to examine beliefs assumptions and biases is somebody biased against this group or another group or maybe they're biased against uh, uh, child molesters How do you define child abuse? If you spank your child, are, have you abused them? And some people don't think you should touch your child. Other people think that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. So which is which? What is, which, which one is right? And is it your job to figure out which one is right? Or is it your job to deal with the individual? <clears throat> and try to get them to treat their child normally. What is normal? Oh my goodness, this is terrible, I know. <laughs> Back in the 1950s, uh, it was uh, people raised their children in a Victorian manner. They did. Uh, so they didn't touch them, except to spank them. They didn't smile at them. They weren't nice to them. They were afraid that they would spoil them. And there were child psychologists out there telling them, don't touch your child, don't hug them, don't smile at them, uh, or you're going to spoil your, spoil your child. So there are a lot of people that were, were raised that way. My dad was relatively affectionate, but looking back, he wasn't all that affectionate. He was just a lot more affectionate than all the other people, because other males didn't have anything to do with their children at all. They ate with them at, at night. And if you grew up in West Virginia, you didn't eat with your children. Coal miners ate first. They always ate first. And then the family ate. But he didn't have anything to do with his kids. He never told them that he loved them. He never touched them. He never hugged them. He certainly never kissed them. So who was I talking about? Oh, you were talking about kissing. Yeah, and, and hugging. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was taboo. 
Uh, my family grew up without very much physical affection. <clears throat> but when I was up north, oh my God. Have you ever been to a powwow up north? Everybody gets hugged. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> uh, you feel like you're part of the community. Everybody wants to hug you. It's kind of great. Anyway, that's just the way it works. Uh, what, what am I talking about? I guess I've only... Perceptions. Oh yeah, perceptions. Okay. <laughs> Uh, how do we learn about other cultures? So how do you learn about other cultures? Let me, don't let me go over. Okay. Uh, how do you, so how do we learn about other cultures? Well, as we're going to learn in cultural psychology, how many people are in cultural psychology? This is my favorite. I love this class. I have such a good time in cultural psychology. One of the things I'm going to make you do is read a book. I know. Oh, my God. Donald Trump could never take my class because he doesn't read. <laughs> and he, he brags about it. Have you ever seen him write? He writes with a with a felt tip marker. I don't know. It's like an indelible marker. Who does that? You guys are writing with pens or pencils. And here he writes with a felt tip marker. So uh, yeah, I'm going to make you guys read a book about another culture. So one of the ways that you can learn about other races and other cultures is to read about them. Uh, uh, one of the things I did before I came here, actually, I, I had read Hellerman a long, long time ago. I really enjoyed his, I, I like mystery stories. And that's, it was really kind of exciting. So uh, when, uh, when I took this job, uh, I, I reread all of my Hellerman books. Uh, and, they're, and they're relatively, I mean, it just explains the culture. And it gives you an idea about the culture. Of course, it, I mean, boots on the ground tell you that it's, it ain't the same. As the as the story, there are cheese, but I haven't met any leaphorns yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> I work with a cheese, so that's kind of interesting. A lot of Yazis, but no bidets in the movie in, in the book. It's kind of interesting. Uh, but I was reading a book right uh, just before I, I uh, as I was driving out here from Iowa. I talked about shiprock and going over the mountain, and, and uh, it's really kind of interesting. So I recognize places, it's really kind of, kind of fun. We recognize the strengths and weaknesses of dominant and minority racial groups. We need to, uh, to do that, is recognize who they are. Uh, we need to develop meaningful uh, relationships with people from various ra racial and cultural groups. We can gain a different perspective on all people if we can do that. So you need to have friends who ain't the same as you are. You shouldn't only sit and eat lunch with people that look like you, or act like you, or, I know, mm -hmm. sorry. So if you were in a clique when you were in high school or whatever, uh, you need to talk to everybody. You need to talk to that strange guy that sits in the corner. That really odd fella that eats by himself. Go ahead, talk to him, see what he has to say. It may be that... Uh, that he farts a lot and doesn't want anybody around him. Can I say fart? Can I? <laughs> Travis has to, has to censor me from time to time. By developing relationships with uh, colleagues and mentors who are willing to discuss cultural and racial issues, not the easiest thing in the world. I've had friends who are of different, uh, uh, different groups, uh, and usually this is, this is what I want to talk about. But sometimes they won't, and they won't tell me the truth. Sometimes they'll tell me what they think I want to hear, and I don't want that. I want them to tell me what they're thinking. And this is tough. This is a really tough uh, situation. I want to know what's going on. <clears throat> so uh, I do have a good friend here, Marius Begay. Marius and I talk all the time. He doesn't tell, I don't tell him about white people, but he tells me about Snowflake all the time. <laughs> ah, snowflake, what a place. Uh, we can watch films about other races. We can watch, there's television shows about other races. Some of them are stereotyped. Maybe the rich Asian thing is, is a stereotype. Uh, I don't know how many Asians you've been around, but I used to live in Japan. And I also used to live in Korea, which was kind of interesting. So, then of course I've been there. I've been to Vietnam. 
but I wasn't very nice to the people there. Mm. And they were really mean to me, so I kept getting shot at. Uh, participating in cultural activities or visiting other countries. Uh, this is a, an Indian, uh, something, something from India, I'm not exactly sure what. Uh, I worked with a guy from, uh, from India, it's really fascinating. Uh, he was an Aryan. The Aryans actually came out of India. <clears throat> but he was extremely dark. He was very dark. Uh, and we had some really fascinating conversations. I mean, do you, do you know anybody from India? Do you know what they're like? Do you know what they want? He was a vegetarian. He was also a Seventh-day Adventist. Do you, know any, do you have any idea who Seventh-day Adventists are? They're vegetarians too, yeah. <laughs> They're vegetarians and they can't do anything on Saturday, which is kind of exciting. Uh, when I was growing up, we had a, uh, a pitcher that was a Seventh-day Adventist. And so if we had a game on Saturday, guess who didn't pitch? Yeah, he didn't pitch. So it's really kind of interesting. Seventh-day Adventist. <clears throat> oh. Culture has a strong influence uh, on uh, the roles that many people see as appropriate, uh, proper behavior of children toward parents, uh, level of independence and autonomy of children. Uh, I don't know. I, how do you raise your kids? I call my children baby, my babies. My son's 48 and my daughter's 50. And they're still my babies. But that's part of my culture. You probably don't refer to your children as your babies, adult children as babies. But uh, they will always be my babies. Uh, my grandson is, is my baby because he's seven. I'm sorry, he's six. <laughs> he's six years old and he hates it. He hates it when I call, talk about him as, as if he were a baby. But he's my baby and that's part of my culture. Just part of my culture. Patterns of communication between parents and children. Uh, family boundaries and responsibilities, expression of emotions, and of course this is all has to do with, uh, with your traditions, with your culture. All of this is dictated. What do you do with your old people? What do you do with your old people? According to your culture and your country. I'm sorry? The country you're from and the culture you live within. So what do you do with them? And if you're, I have, I have a nice husband from Italy, and um, he said that in Italy, the old people, they don't have nursing homes. The family takes care of the elderly. But in Germany, there's a nursing home in every town. And people can't wait to retire so that they can go to the nursing home. What do they do in the nursing home? They play cards all day, and then they go to the gas house at night and get drunk a lot. But they drink some. They drink some beers. But there's one in every town. <laughs> we lived in Mauschbach. Mauschbach is on the French uh, border. It's a German town. But there were two uh, homes for for the elderly in that town. It was a tiny little place. It's less than a thousand people. The town next do next door to us had six buildings, and the biggest one was well, the biggest one was the gas house. But the that, the gas house is like a bar. It's like a saloon. But right across the street was the old folks' home. It only had six buildings in the whole town. But there, one of the buildings was an old folks' home. And that's the way they do it in Germany. And people can't wait to go to nursing homes. Well, no, they're not really nursing homes. They're just homes for old people. They get to be around people but listen to the same music that you do, which is kind of exciting. I got a playlist in my in my car, 227 songs, and I, I would imagine none of you have ever heard any of them, because <laughs> I'm all old. <laughs> so all my music comes from the 50s, the 60s, and 70s. I've only got one song that's from the 21st century in my playlist. Yeah. It's probably not even for the 21st century. Just the fever. Uh, and if I add a song, it's like a song from 1970 or 1980 or something. Which would be? I know. We all have our eras, right? Okay, give us some of your, your titles. 50 songs. No. <laughs> no. What's your 50 songs? I'm sorry? 
So what's your 50s song? My 50s songs, uh, what is the one I keep listening to? Oh, I, I can't I can't think of titles. I, but there's like 220 songs. Sing it. I'll, I'll bring it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'd love that, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, a song a day, that'll get us through the semester. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll bring my playlist, it's like 12 hours or so. <laughs> And uh, I'll, I'll let you listen to it. Uh. <laughs> Gwen Stefani. Right? Is she still making music? Because I have a son. She, she's, I think that's my only 21st song. So. It's probably made me make a Cultural values can influence feelings about work. <laughs> <laughs> Cultural values can influence feelings about education. Some uh, groups don't like education. Some uh, ethnic groups do not like education. They don't appreciate education. They think the educational system was set up for white people. And actually there's a television show on HBO, Park Ridge or something. Anyway, they, uh, there's a small, there's a minority uh, group of African Americans going to this school and they complain that the, the school was set up for white people. And in, in essence, it kind of is. Uh, I'm teaching you Western psychology. Western psychology isn't, Western psychology does it fit Hispanics? Does it fit African Americans? Does it fit Asians? Do they practice the same type of psychology in Korea and Japan that they do in the United States? Do they practice the same psychology in a Europe, in Germany, in England than they, that they do, that we do in the United States? No. So what I'm teaching you is American psychology. If we look at music, music has been heavily influenced by other groups. It's not white music. Well, it kind of is, but it's not really white music. Uh, Elvis Presley uh, started singing uh, back in the, in the 1950s, and his music was very similar to, uh, to African-American uh, uh, blues music. Or, or whatever. Yeah, okay. And even some of the songs were the same. And that has, has influenced uh, the way that we listen to music. Well, our thoughts are the same way. Uh, do we have any great African-American scholars in psychology? Do we have any females in psychology? Yes, but they don't get published. They don't get published. Yeah. They don't get published. So almost all of the psychology that we will be teaching you is male psychology. It's not only male psychology, but it's probably uh, East Coast psychology. If you Rogers is from Chicago. Who else is from Chicago? Somebody else. Rogers is from Chicago, and that's the, the type of uh, psychology that I'm going to teach you. Carl Rogers was from Chicago. Egan is from Los Angeles. Egan's model of uh, Rogerian psychology. All white guys. All males. <clears throat> guys. Well, I said guys. Sorry. So different groups don't have the same idea about education. Uh, different native groups don't have the same idea about education. There are, what, 36 tribal colleges? Yeah. Yeah, 36 tribal colleges. But some reservations have a real hard time getting anybody to take classes, even though they have a, a tribal college, because they don't have the same ideas about education. Is that because they do not include their tribal philosophies and culture and and Most of the co tribal colleges teach that. The, 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 the Most of the tribal colleges, uh, no, they do. They do. Uh, I've taught at uh, I taught at Fort Belknap, which is now on the Dakota College. I taught at Sage Kootenai up in uh, up in Montana. Mm -hmm. They do include uh, their culture. Uh, I had an individual that came down from Alaska, and uh, he took a class about whale culture. Well, you guys are going to learn about whale. Right? <laughs> How the whale is so important to our culture. Is the whale important to your culture? Is <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, they, they, most of them do. Uh, and that's the reason they started the tribal college was to uh, continue the culture, uh, to, uh, to save the language, because native languages are, are, are disappearing, including uh, the Diné language. Uh, so everybody needs to practice it as much as possible. Uh, other tribe, of course, you know, the boarding schools wouldn't let, allow you to, to speak uh, your native language. A lot of people lost their language. So there are tribes that, own, that have completely lost their language, which is a tragedy. So that's why they, they started the tribal colleges. But uh, there are places that uh, males don't sit down and are, are educated. It's the females that are going to college. And if we look at the population here, well, we can look in this room. What's the percentage of males in the room? What is it? About 60, 40? Yeah. And that's about, that's about right all over the United States. So what the hell's going on with men? Are they that stupid that they... They're <laughs> not that lazy. <laughs> well, let's not talk about how stupid men are. <laughs> we could be here all day. <laughs> Cultural values can influence feelings about religion, of course. Uh, you have your religion. Uh, Mormon, Mormon, we're not supposed to use that term. Uh, I just read it in the, uh, in, on CNN. You're not supposed to use the, the term Mormonism anymore. You're supposed to, oh, really? What yeah. happened to that? Um, it refers to uh, the uh, Saint Mormon or some Book of Mormon. Book, Book of Mormon. And they don't want to be referred to as Mormon anymore. They want to be called uh, Church of. The Latter Day Saints. Well, LDS for short. LDS. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, real strong around here, uh, but uh, of course it's primarily here. Uh, if you go anyplace else in the United States, not so much. Uh, Idaho, Washington, uh, fairly strong. Utah, of course. Utah. Idaho, Wyoming, Idaho. Uh, so. <clears throat> Isn't that because of their territory that they wanted to buy out here? They wanted to buy the almost the entire Southwest. But Oh, I don't know about the history. Uh, they started in Palmyra, New York. Palmyra, New York? Yes. Yeah, and then they walked all the way across the United States and stopped in Nauvoo in, in Illinois. Uh, Smith was martyred in, uh, it's not here, Palmyra, it was right across the river. Right across the Mississippi. All right. Anyway, I've been there. My ex-wife, uh, when she left me, she she went to that city. Oh I know, <laughs> and she sh started shacking up with some guy. <laughs> I know, and I know this is a tragic, tragic story. I won't go. I know I'm about to cry, so I'll be alright. <laughs> <laughs> so religion's really important, um, uh, and and you need to understand how the how the religions are different. Uh, you need to, to find out about the different religions. If you've got somebody that's uh, a, a Seventh-day Adventist, well, what, what do they believe? Or somebody that's Presbyterian, or somebody that's an Episcopalian, somebody that's a Catholic. Catholics are very much different from Protestants. Uh, you just need to understand what their mindset might potentially be and how they feel about them. I've been married to, I, I don't go to church, I'm not a religious person, but I've been married to three people that were religious, strangely enough. I mean, how did I do that? You know, how did I, how did I induce these people to marry me? And the answer is, uh, all of them wore glasses. So that's, that's your answer right there. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said before, I look better from far away, so. There you go. Uh, why don't we stop right here? We'll pick this up next time. And I'll try to be good next time. I'll try to not be bad anyway. Selecting them on their motherly instincts. Ah, no. no. Uh, motherly instincts. Yeah. You know. No, I didn't select them on the motherly instincts. Uh, so if you guys have any questions about anything, I guess we're finished. Uh, next time we'll pick it up right here. If, plus, I can't remember where I am. So, uh, yeah, next time we'll talk about this again. Uh, think about who, you, who your character is going to be. Give them a really cool name. That's the most important part is your name. Uh, but they have to have a problem that you don't have, of course, and that you've never experienced. So, 
we don't want to. The problem is that if you select something that you have have had in the past, it may cause you to relapse. Yeah. You will start identifying with your character. So if it's something anywhere close to any any problem that you've had, you may start having that problem again. And then that's my fault. But it has to be a problem that you don't have anything to do with. Okay? Like I told you my character's an alcoholic. And a really bad thing. I'm like one of the worst. I haven't had a drink since 1976. <laughs> You don't have to worry about I and I think alcohol tastes like shh. Tastes really bad. <laughs> Pets. Let's say pets, not shit, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I know, people drink that stuff. I can't believe they drink that stuff. Somebody got me drunk on Tom Collins one time. Tom Collins has gin in it, but it, you can't taste it. Really? I mean, it's really sweet, so that's the reason I drink. Anyway, she was trying to get me drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as bored. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as blind and stupid as I see. Where's my bore? <laughs> Thank you. It jumped off my off hand. 724 oh. 6620. Yeah, is that where we leave our off messages? Yeah, you can. Somebody left me a, a message. They just fired it huh? three times. Oh my gosh, you <laughs> So wow. if I end up dead, it's probably shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fire enough for AK-47. <laughs> <Okay. clears throat> so what class are you going to have now? Uh, I don't have a class until 1 o'clock. Uh, I think um, Sue's in here, right? Okay. Yeah. She's from Wisconsin. You think she's going to... I'll just leave it. Oh, yeah. What's the next?